I want to thank everybody for being on this phone call today. Uh, this is Brother Joshua Kenny Greenwood. I am the senior pastor here at the Empowerment Center Church in churchfreedom.org. This recording will be uploaded at a later time at our SoundCloud account, and you can listen to our previous week um, and our previous week's worth of messages. They're at soundcloud.com forward slash churchfreedom. Um, thank you very much. Today is going to be a very important message. I know that's going to be the case because the Lord kept me up. Holy Spirit's been keeping me up at night, you know, at the at the midnight hour, you know, in the twilight uh, to uh, take the notes and to study and receive the revelation for today's message. And so today's message is very, very important. And now it's important that before we get started that you understand that everything that is spoken today is backed up by Scripture, okay? Everything has to be backed up by Scripture because Jesus, it's Jesus himself who said in John 10, uh, verse 35, he said, Scripture cannot be set aside, okay? All Scripture must be taken into account. So let's go on ahead and we're going to get, uh, in, and again, where, where Jesus says that, you know, this Scripture can never be set aside is in John 10, chapter 10, verse 35. So let's go ahead and get started with, uh, I would say, is one of the most profound scriptures in the whole Bible. And it's found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. I'm going to say it again so you can write it down for those of you that are taking notes. It's found in Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23. And this is Jesus speaking. And he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles, and I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Oh, whoa. This, guys, this, this is one of the most, I would, I would say, truthful and terrifyingly powerful scriptures in the entirety of the Bible, this thing just breaks it down. He's literally saying here that you can say, you can, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, perform miracles. You can prophesy. Okay? You can even drive out demons. There's not even a lot of that going on today, okay? And still, he says, unless you are the unless, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And if you don't do that, he'll say, I never knew you. He'll tell you plainly, I never even knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now. That's kind of important. So you would think that we in the church would make it our business to know what is the will of the Father. That's a really important aspect. I mean, if God is sitting here telling you that you can drive out demons, prophesy, and perform miracles, and still not enter into the kingdom of heaven, only unless you're doing the will. Now, you would think that prophesying and casting out demons and performing miracles all in the name of Jesus Christ is doing the will of God, right? You, I mean, we would all surmise that, oh, I'm doing God's will because I'm doing this. Oh, no. There's a difference. And so what you have to understand is, what is the difference between the will of the Father and your will? Like when we pray, when he says, Lord, let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Let, let your will be done and not my own. Okay, so, we, so it is very important to find out 
what is God's will considering that based on this scripture of Matthew seven twenty one through 23, that not doing the will of the Father is that the stakes are so high that he says if you don't do that, even if you prophesy, cast out demons, and perform miracles, he'll tell you plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. So I look up the, the definition of the word will. And the definition of the word will is defined as the faculty by which a person decides on and initiates action. It is synonymous with uh, determination, willpower, uh, resolution, resoluteness, tenacity, staying power, purposefulness. Another meaning uh, uh, says that it is to control deliberately, exerted to do something, or to restrain one's own personal uh, impulses. It's a noun meaning willpower. Okay, so it is the faculty by which, so you've got two wills, okay? you got, you got two wills. You've got your will, and then you've got God's will. And technically, you even have Satan's, you know, will. That's why we have the discerning of spirits, right? Okay. So the will, it says, is the faculty by which a person decides on and initiates action. Now, with this being said, it is up to us to determine, okay, the decisions that we make, if it's the case where it, it is the faculty by which a person decides on and initiates action, okay, what is that limited to and where does that go? Because what God is, is doing here is he's saying, unless you do the will of the Father, but only the one who does the will of the Father in heaven will enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So we need to begin asking the question, Lord, what is it that you want me, what, where do you want me to go today? Lord, what do you want me to minister about? Lord, do you want me to speak to this particular person? Lord, how would you lead me to pray for X, Y, Z? When you begin asking these questions before you arbitrarily decide, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to get in the proverbial car and go do it myself. Lord, do you want me to get into the car? And do you want me to go and do X, Y, Z? Now, I'm going to reaffirm this, what Jesus says. It's, it's reaffirmed when he speaks in, in this tone that, you know, when he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. He reaffirms this in the scripture of Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, 31 and 35. Again, that's Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 21 and verses 31 through 35. And this is what he says. And I'm going to read it concurrently. He says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for, for they said, He is out of his mind. So remember, if, if you if you have family members that, that that you you know you love Jesus and you're doing His will and they think you that you're out of your mind, okay, just always remember that you know Jesus's own family literally thought he was out of his mind. So when his family heard about this, they went out to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. Then Jesus's mothers and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and my brother and, and my mother. Only the people that are doing God's will are ones that he counts as his true family. He didn't even count his 
actual family as his true family, but only the ones that are doing the will of God are his true family. Just like I've got true brothers and sisters here that listen and obey the will of, of the will of God, you are my true brothers and sisters more than my own actual true family. Think about this concept. Because the ones who do the will of God are going to be the ones that go into heaven. So how do we hear God's will? This is what it comes down to. How 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 do we begin to differentiate what is God's will compared to your will? What's the difference? How do you determine what is God's will compared to you walking out your own will? And this is absolutely critical in the days ahead because because of the spirit of of deception that's coming into this world is just so incredible right now. I mean, even the level of false prophecy is significant. Uh, the 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 uh, the lies that are being spoken by government propaganda is just significant. I mean, it is just saturating every facet of life. And so to know the difference between God's will and your will is critical because then you know where to position yourself in the days ahead. So how do we hear God's will? All right. Well, first off, let's go let's let's go to the scriptures. Let's first go to Matthew chapter 22 verses 36 through 40. Again, it's Matthew 22, 36 through 40. And there's someone, and he says, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Okay, so we're supposed to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and with all your mind, right? So here we're going to have to understand what exactly is love. And this is critical that we begin to understand what what exactly is love. If love is the most single, most important thing that God is describing here that you have to do, and as an attribute of setting your heart to this love, you fulfill all the prof- all the law and all the prophets saying within these two great commandments in regards to law. This is what we call the royal law of love. This is what the word says when it describes the royal law. Okay, So every attribute, including hearing from the Lord to know what his will is and not your own, comes and it derives from love. So what? is love. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, and verse 13. Again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 8, and also verse 13. Give me one second. All right, it says, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, and it says, and this is in regards to love, it says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. I'm going to stop there. That just reaffirms exactly what Jesus said. He said, there will be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not perform miracles? Did we not cast out demons? Here, Paul is literally writing, you can have the gift of prophecy. You can fathom all the mysteries, all the knowledge. You can have faith that can move mountains. But if you do not have love, you are nothing. You can speak in tongues, he says. You can speak in the language of angels. You can literally speak in tongues. But if you do not have love, you're nothing more than a sound. You are nothing. If, in verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor and give my body over to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So what is love? In verse 4, it says love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. 
It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now, love, you've been taught, is the central nexus of all of the spiritual gifts. Love is the nexus. It is the, it is the supreme element in which all other gifts of the Spirit derive from. So, the gifts of the Spirit are described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. Again, the gifts of the Spirit are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. That same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that is love. Okay, that's, that's love. So it's the same spirit. So the, the spirit of love, the Holy Spirit, distributes them, even though there are different kinds of gifts, they all come from the same central nexus, which is love itself. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in, in them all and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one is given through the, through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, this is very important because located inside of these gifts comes faith. Now, this has been taught, but for those who haven't heard this before, okay, I, you know, what is, the, what is the difference between the gift of faith and the gift of prophecy or miracle signs and wonders, right? This is a question that I asked the Lord a long time ago. I said, you know, God, there, 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 ha, there, there has to be a difference. What is the difference between faith and these different gifts? Because one would surmise that you have to have faith in order to have miracle signs and wonders. One would surmise you have to have faith in order to have prophecy, but yet faith is its own singular specific gift. Well, the reason faith stands out and the reason why it's important in relationship to love and the royal law of love, as love is the nexus of all spiritual gifts and we're called to set our hearts to love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, and soul, okay, it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, again, Romans 10, verse 17, it says in regards to faith, so then faith, only comes by hearing. So faith only comes by hearing. Well, this is important. This is this is this is this is absolutely critical that you hear what the Lord is telling you what to do. It is absolutely critical that you hear what the Lord is determining for you to do. What is his will and not your own? Because your will, in many cases, we think of life, we think and we act upon our own material emotional impulses based upon our present circumstances. Okay, so if 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 someone's in trouble, our impulse is to go in that particular direction. If someone asks us to agree with them in prayer, our impulse is to immediately agree. If if uh, someone, you know, if something happens in our lives, our our emotional impulses are to react in a particular way. And here God is saying that unless you do the will of the Father who is in heaven, there will be many that will be on that day that say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? 
cast out demons, perform miracles in your name. And he says to them plainly, be away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. So there is power. There is literal power in the name of Jesus Christ. There is power in that name. But just because there is power in the name, in the exorcism of the use of the name, does not guarantee you entry into the kingdom, only doing the will of the Father. And the only way you're going to know what the will of the Father is, is by first setting your heart to love, understanding that faith only comes through hearing, Faith is an attribute of the gift of the Spirit that derives directly from love so that you can hear him clearly so that when you ask the Lord a question, Lord, what should I pray about? Well, he's going to tell you what you need to pray about. Lord, what should I do today? Lord, lead my footsteps. Lord, what should I do in X, Y, Z? That by faith, he is the one that gives you that answer, and you will hear his voice on what you need to say and what you don't need to say. He will focus your attention. What do you need to study and what do you not need to study? In fact, that happened to me last night. I'm sitting there listening to the Holy Spirit as I was preparing this message and writing these notes, and I, my mind began to wander off on, on something I wanted to study. And he told me, don't study that. You don't need to study that. Well, it goes even to the point where he will direct even your thoughts on what you need to think about and what you don't need to think about. And this is absolutely critical. You understand this because your entry into the kingdom is detrimental on you obeying the will of the Father and not your own. So, if any one of you lacks faith, if any one of you lacks faith, well, what does it say to do? If you're at a place, if you're at a place in your life, okay, you're an adult, you're a person that is listening to this recording or you're listening to this conversation right now as it's live, and no one has ever taught you how to make decisions based off listening solely to the Holy Spirit. And 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 if I were to ask you, when is the last time you ever heard the voice of the Lord spoken to you? Very few of you would would be able to uh, answer and say, I I I heard him this morning. He told me exactly what I needed to do. Okay, because we have not been properly taught to make all of our decisions based off what we hear, even though we have access to that gift every single day. And it's not limited to just the most important things of your life. It can be down to the simple things, okay, like I've given examples of our livestock here on the farm where we had issues with our cows and, and you know, the Internet has, you know, 15,000 different answers, and so we needed a straight answer. So what we did is we went to prayer, we asked the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gave us the answer that was completely and totally non-conventional. You know, what do we do about this when, when a cow has scours and he says, go get cream of wheat? That doesn't make any sense to me, Okay. That doesn't make any sense, and that's not what a single farmer ever said on the Internet. But the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, go get cream of wheat. And so following and obeying his will, I went and I got cream of wheat. And when we gave the cow the cream of wheat, it immediately stopped their scours, which is really bad diarrhea. It's when they become dehydrated because they're losing all of their nutrients in their in their uh, hydration from uh, the diarrhea, and, and we call that scours. So this is where we begin to train ourselves as believers that 
we go into the spirit and we ask the Lord in regards to his will in every aspect of our life. And be prepared that he's going to tell you some things that don't line up with your desires of wanting to go in a certain direction. He'll tell you no. Don't go in that direction. Then you've got a choice. You have the choice. You can go in that direction and you can you can make that decision and make that mistake, okay? And believe me, we've all made that mistake, including myself, where we know that we've heard the Lord the, the Lord's voice and we go in that direction. And 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 I pray that you don't, you know, suffer terrible consequences because there are some lessons there's some wisdom in this world that you don't get to learn twice. There's some mistakes that you don't recover from. And so uh, if, if, if you do, I pray that this lesson will allow you to hone that voice so that you know and you obey and you go in the opposite direction and you obey and you do exactly what the Holy Spirit says. For those of you that make mistakes, it's okay to repent of those mistakes. Immediately when the Lord told me, not to begin studying, even last night. He, he told, uh, I was finishing up, I was wrapping up this, this entire teaching, and my heart started wandering to a place where I wanted to study in relationship to another topic in the Word, and he told me not to do it, and I started to do it, right? He told me not to. And so after about, you know, five, ten minutes, I repented to the Lord, and I said, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have even... I shouldn't even spend one minute. I should have never even gone in this direction. I repent for even going in this direction. It is good for you to do that. That shows your humility. That that shows your meekness, which is a fruit of the Spirit. To humble yourself before the Lord and to fear the Lord and to repent and to always set your mind in hearing him what he tells you what not to do and what he tells you to do. So, Here's what the word says for those of you that do lack faith. So if you lack faith, if you're at a place as an adult, you're at a place where you're a listener and you're hearing this, and you've never lived your life in such a degree where you can actually realistically hear the Lord in every circumstance of your life where you can go to him, you can ask him a question, and he will honestly give you that answer, and you can hear him for everything that you can do throughout your day, and you have never experienced that before, okay, and this is new to you, you're like, I've never even heard that, that, that I can actually walk that out, or I haven't experienced that, all right, but I would like to experience that because the stakes are so high, you know, when Jesus is saying, they're saying that, you know, unless the one does the will of the Father, that, 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 uh, that they're not going to enter in the kingdom of heaven, okay, if you would like that, then we must follow the instructions that the book of James gives us. It says in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. And here's what it says. Again, that's the book of James, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. And this, this, this principle applies not just to wisdom, but also to the gift of faith, which is said in Romans 10, 17, only comes by hearing. So it says, this is what James writes. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, so we're going to just replace the word wisdom with faith. So faith only comes by hearing, and you really want to hear because that's the will of the Father. Okay, So we're going to replace this word. So we're going to say, this is what James says. If any of you lacks faith, you want to hear, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That means you can ask the Holy Spirit for an increase of faith, and God will give it to you generously without finding fault. That means he will not even hold your past and all of your mistakes against you. He will freely give it to you without measuring the mistakes that you've made in saying you don't deserve this because of where you fall short. I'm going to give it to you generously. Uh, without finding fault, and it says, and it will be given to you. But, but, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That 
person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Oh, all right. God just laid it down. All right. You want to receive an increase of faith so that you can hear every single solitary day, okay, what you need to be doing so you know the will of the Lord, which is defined as the faculty by which a person decides on and initiates action. So the, the very factor in which you decide on and initiate action and every action that's in your life needs to be God's will and not your own only comes by hearing. And you want to increase the level of faith that's inside of you, and it says here in James that you need to ask the Lord, and he will give it to you generously, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. You have to absolutely believe it. You've got to believe that you receive it to surmise this, that you believe that you actually serve a God who makes the impossible possible, that that is a singular truth in your consciousness, and in your heart, and then you set your heart to love. And when you love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, and soul, when you focus all of your love, all of your desires, all of your unctions, everything in your spirit to that love, and you ask him to increase your capacity to love, which increases your capacity for faith. Lord, increase my faith then what happens is when you ask him and you do not doubt, but you believe, he will give it to you generously. Then be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared to live an unconventional, a totally, completely unconventional life after that. Totally unconventional. Be prepared for that. Because when you start living 100% on faith, the decisions that God leads you to are not going to make your natural senses a lick of common sense. You might have God tell you to quit your job. And yet in the back of your mind, your natural senses are telling you, uh, well, uh, what am I going to do for work? How How is the provision going to come in? How, you know, what's that little devil's advocate? Well, what if, 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 right? You can think of a billion different what ifs, but you know that you heard the Lord tell you to quit your job. Now, this is just an example. It's not telling people that are advocating that they go quit their jobs. That's not for everybody. But as an example, when you live by faith and you're walking out the will of the Lord, he's going to tell you to do things that are completely unconventional. And and I would say this with confidence in almost every single case. They will he will always ask you to do something that directly confronts the thing that most people would fear the most. For the rich young ruler, he says, I follow all I do all the Ten Commandments. I live by every one of them. He goes, That's great. He goes, Well what what do I do now? That he goes, That's fantastic. Now go sell everything that you have Come and follow me. Go, go sell everything that you own. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. For a person, they, God might tell them, quit your job. Well, how, do you, how are you going to make ends meet? Well, but by your obedience, that's where your breakthrough comes from. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God starts bringing people into your life that supernaturally provide for you. God tells me to live on faith. I remember it was months and months and months and months ago we had a, a moment where our, you know, God said every need was met. That was the word that came comes by faith. I heard the word. It was spoken through my wife, who is a prophet of God, and God spoke to her, and I stood on that word. That word hasn't failed, but here it is. My refrigerator is getting down to the last tortilla, okay? <laughs> it's getting down to the last. I took a picture of it and gave it to the church, right? And I said, by faith. I've got a negative ninety dollars in our church account. Negative ninety dollars. There's we're down to the last tortilla. Okay, they got nothing but the half empty ketchup bottle in the refrigerator. I'm getting in the car with a half tank of gas, ninety dollars in the hole, 
and I am by faith going to go to Walmart, and I'm going to get myself some groceries. And I put it out there to the, to the church. God told me to fill up two baskets, two carts full of food. And by the time I got to the checkout, the Holy Spirit brought forth every resource that was necessary so that I could end up buying over two huge shopping carts full of food and fill that storehouse up in a day. doesn't make any sense. That's going out and doing the will of the Father, walking it out, doing what he tells you to do when he tells you to do it. And so if any of you lack faith and you desire to hear from the Lord, ask him to increase your faith. Ask him. If you have been operating your life, if you've been operating your life without securing that voice speak to you from the Holy Spirit, and you've been operating your life based off your good intentions, then it is good for you to humble yourself before the Lord and repent. It is good of you to repent to the Lord, who will forgive you. He forgives all sins, and he will restore you based on your heart of humility. It's good for you to repent. Because you have not been doing the will of the Father. You've been basing your life based off your good intentions. And don't feel condemned. We've all made that mistake, including myself. We've all made that mistake. But, but saints of God, the stakes are so high. And he says in Matthew seven twenty one through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In, in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. But then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So exercising power is not the same as walking out the will of the Father. God's will will be performed irregardless of whether or not you exercise spiritual authority by using the name of Jesus Christ. Using the name of Jesus Christ absolutely will wield great authority, but that does not guarantee you entry into the kingdom of heaven. So here is a warning to those that think in their mind that spiritual gifts qualify their entry into heaven. Let's go to Luke chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. And this is John the Baptist. This is, this is the voice calling in the desert that Jesus says had the spirit, the, the spirit of Elijah was upon him. Okay? And this is, this is John speaking. He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. This is absolutely pivotal. I had someone in my house just the other day, uh, last Thursday, I had this young lady that was in my house. And I was I was telling her, I, says, I, I said, um, uh, they, they were mentioning a family member that had a degree uh, in worship in in the church. I didn't even know you could get a degree in worship, you know, in singing. And 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 to to just like disarm any religious spirit that derives from any conditions that one thinks that they have to serve in that capacity. The Holy Spirit had me tell them don't think that anything is special because God can raise apostles and prophets out of the rocks of the earth. So don't think, don't think that, that titles make something. Don't believe that the extra of the gifts make a difference. Out of the rocks, God can raise up a prophet or an apostle. This is why John said, don't think that because you call yourself a son or daughter of Abraham as he's sitting there speaking to the Jews, don't think that makes you special. God can raise up sons for Abraham right out of the rocks. It is not by a title. It is not by that recognition. It is not by the exorcision of gifts that gets 
to the entry, it's by the good fruit. And the only way you're going to even walk out that good fruit and be that vine that produces those that good fruit, that gets pruned by the Lord so it produces bigger fruit, is by setting your heart to love, loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, asking the Lord for an increase of faith, and asking and believing and not doubting so that uh, you're not a man, as it says, that is double-minded, that should expect to receive nothing, that you are receiving and God is then producing that good fruit. Then it also says in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20, again, that's Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20, says, Jesus says, uh, the, the 72 returned, this is the 72 disciples that he sent out and gave them the authority to overcome every work of the enemy. The 72 returned with joy, and they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Again, there's power in the name. There's power in the name of Jesus. They're sitting there sitting there boasting about the fact that even demons submit to us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, demons can submit to the name of Jesus to a person that won't even enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's how powerful the name of Jesus is. It's so powerful that a person can use it, it will still have its effects, which is why Jesus said in the scripture, it will cast out demons and prophesy in my name, in my name perform miracles, in my name cast out demons. But I'll still say to them, be away from me, you evildoers. So they come back and they're sitting there boasting of their, of their use of these gifts. And they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw, behold, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that your names are written in heaven. That means take it back to humility. Take it back to humility. Get your heart back to a humble spirit, which is meekness. Take it back to meekness. Right? Because because what is meekness? That is to compose yourself. Meekness meekness is 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 enduring injury with patience and without resentment. Meekness is also knowing that there is a supreme intelligence in this universe that's greater than your own, and it can kill you and destroy you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Give it respect. That's why it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is not more important, your, the exorcision of spiritual gifts, more than it is that your heart goes back to humility, which is one of the key attributes to love itself. And in order for you to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself, one must adopt a heart of humility and humbleness to the Lord, hear the Lord, and then recognize that the power belongs to him and to the glory of his name alone, and to never be proud. This is why when they said, even the demons submit to us in your name, the very first thing that Jesus mentioned was Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Because Satan and his pride, he took pride in the exorcision of the gifts that he had the knowledge and the authority to exercise. And Satan in his pride and in his arrogance understands he understands the power of prayer, and he uses it detrimentally. I mean, that's why I say, you know, Satan prays more than believers do. He stands, says he stands before the, the throne of heaven day and night, accusing accusing the brethren. Well, there's a purpose for that. He masquerades as an angel of light, but inside it's just death and decay, a, a never-ending consuming fire of hatred and spite and malice towards you. So do not be envious of the authority that God gives you, but always be thankful 
and turn your heart to humility, which is a key attribute of love, that your names are merely written down in that book, and you will keep yourself a space where you do not give in to temptation and go off in making a decision uh, and go off and lead your heart into a direction that's no longer the will of the Father. Don't be fooled, okay? God will still get his way. The outcome will still be predetermined, even if a person decided, well, they're still going to go out there and do that. In the end, his will is still going to get done, but only the ones who do the will of the Father. That means the ones who only make the decisions based off what God's decisions are and not their own, they're the ones who have humbled themselves to a contrite spirit to hear that are going in that direction. So the first warning is to those who believe that the people using their spiritual gifts qualify their entry into heaven. Don't get it twisted. You are not qualified by using gifts. You can use gifts from here to kingdom come, and you still won't get two inches into heaven. The second warning is to those with a religious spirit that believe that their righteous acts in observing the law will justify their faith and still get them in entry into heaven. And and for that, uh, Jesus, uh, the, the Holy Spirit disarms that notion in Galatians 5.4, which specifically says, and this is again in Galatians 5.4, for those that believe that observance of the law somehow uh, justifies w- w- getting into heaven. It says, the, whole, the Holy Spirit writes, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have completely fallen away from grace. Whoa! Hard word. That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty keeping it real word. So if you're trying to be justified by the law, you have been alienated from Christ, and you have fallen away from grace. So you have the, anyone who tries to justify themselves based on the law, they fall away from grace. In fact, it even says in James 2.10, which reaffirms this by uh, James, the brother of Jesus, he says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Oh, no. So anyone that tries to keep it, anyone who tries to justify themselves by the law, and they break even one part of the law, they're guilty of breaking all of it. But you'll notice how the religious folks, they'll try to justify themselves by the law and then make everybody feel unclean because of all the mistakes they do in life. Yet by them justifying themselves by the law, they themselves become entrapped and condemned by the law. In fact, it says they've completely fallen away from grace. Grace no longer has any more means to this. And most of them don't even know what the full law is. They don't even realize that the law supersedes not only just the Ten Commandments, but we've got to go, you got to go up to the whole law that's written in Le- Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And, and, and so even in regards to what you wear, you know, you wear two different types of threads, you are considered unclean. If you wipe your nose and you get mucus on your hands, you're considered unclean. Remember, anything that's unclean can't go before the mercy seat and the Holy of Holies. So, so if you justify yourself by the law, you are guilty and you'll fall away from grace. If you try to qualify your entry by the exorcism of spiritual gifts using the name of Jesus Christ, and you use the name of Jesus Christ and you use it successfully, and you cast out demons and you prophesy and you perform miracles in the name of Jesus, you still can't get into heaven. Only the ones who do the will of the Father. Another scripture uh, of people trying to justify themselves based on righteous acts or spirit of religion is in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. And here Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard that came by faith? Did you get it by the observance of the law, or did you get it by faith? And faith comes through love. Love is the nexus. Faith is a unique gift that comes directly from the attribute of love. And through that, faith only comes by hearing. So you are going to hear what the will of God is.
So, sorry about that. So, now you've been given two different warnings. A warning against anyone that thinks their spiritual gifts will qualify them, they're, they're entering into heaven. A warning that those with a religious spirit that believe their righteous acts and observing the law will justify their faith. That's wrong. And then, here's the last warning. A warning to those that believe that their good intentions will lead them, in, will lead them into heaven. And this is where you've got to go to the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 14, verse 12. And there's actually two Proverbs in the Word uh, in regards to this, but we'll just go ahead and use this one. In the book of Proverbs 14, 12, it says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. So you begin to see that there's a way that appears to be right, but in its end, in the end, it leads to death. This is where it is critical that first off, you love the Lord, you desire to receive a word from him, and then when you receive a word that comes by faith and you hear clearly from him, that you no longer worry. But because love always trusts, and that disarms the spirit of fear, that you know are no longer frustrated with God's timing. So love always hopes, and hope, as you were taught last week, disarms the spirit of frustration. So now you're no longer making decisions based off your good intentions because of the way that seems right to you. Well, it may seem like it's right to you, but without that way being determined by the Lord, without going to him first and asking him whether or not you should make that decision and you not getting that answer and you going ahead and doing it anyway, what may seem right to you the word says, in the end, will lead you to death. This is not a game of good intentions. This isn't a game of good intentions. This isn't a game of pride, thinking you can use the, the, the name of the Lord to exercise gifts but not do the will of God. Oh, yeah, you can use, you cannot do the will of God, use the name of Jesus Christ, and perform miracles today. Cast out demons and prophesy today. Okay? By just using his name. That's how powerful his name is. That's how much weight his name has. Still not enter the kingdom of heaven. You can try to justify yourself against the law. You can try to justify your righteous acts and still not enter the kingdom of heaven. Completely fall away from grace. Then you can make decisions based off what you think is right that there is a way that appears right to a man and a woman. It, by all conventional wisdom, makes total sense, right? Makes complete sense. Why not? You should go in that direction, right? Everybody else is going in that direction. It makes perfect sense. You should do it. Everybody else is doing it. You should do it because that makes the most common sense and reasoning. But faith isn't common sense and reasoning. There's no common sense and reasoning and faith? Is there any common sense and reason when the prophet Elijah goes to a widow and who's baking the last bit of bread for themselves, a, you know, a cake, that, and they're going to eat it and die? And he says, he says, well, bake me a cake first. Does that make any sense? But through the obedience in doing the will of the Father by doing so, that widow and her son gained access to unlimited I mean, does it make any sense that there is, you know, a school of prophets, and a prophet puts a bunch of roots into a pot of stew with, with the prophet Elisha, and the, there's poison, literally death in the pot. That's what they said. They're, they said, there's death in the pot, and everybody's eating the stew, and they're all going to die, okay, you know, by, by this death that's in the pot. And then the prophet Elisha, by faith, says, put some flour in the pot. And like somehow now that just like now everybody's not going to die. I mean, does it make sense when the prophet Elisha tells the, the 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 Syrian commander to go dip himself seven times in the Jordan River? He didn't say dip yourself four or five times. He said seven times, and he does so and he's healed. Does it make any sense when when Elisha tells the king he grabs an arrow and this king wants to fight? 
against another kingdom of Aram and says, take the arrow and strike the ground. And, and, and the king strikes the ground only a few times, and the prophet says in anguish, you know, oh, you're supposed to strike the ground six times, but because you only struck it like a few times, you're only going to win a few battles. It, but if you would have struck it like five times, you would have won every single battle. Does that make any sense? Does it make sense to walk around Jericho seven times and then blow trumpets and all of a sudden the largest fortified city in the in the history of the human species up to that point, all of a sudden the walls crumble? Does that make any sense? Does it make any sense? It doesn't make sense, folks. Does it make sense when Jesus literally spit into the mud and rubs it into a person's eyes? Right? Does that make sense? No. It doesn't make sense. You can't reason faith. And the only way you're going to get faith is by hearing it. So there's a way that seems right to you. In conventional wisdom, it makes sense to make those decisions, to get in the car and go your way and drive down that road or do whatever that decision is. But the Lord says, unless you do the will of the Father, not yours, the will of the Father, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is why the people said, I think it's in the book of Mark, you know, they're, they're sitting there sitting there saying, you know, Lord, will anybody be saved? make every effort to get through the narrow door because many I tell you on that day will try to enter but will not be able to this is serious business this is eternity this isn't good intentions this isn't just some lesson you hear today and in five minutes from now you discard this is it this is the business end of your walk with Jesus Christ to know the will of the Father and to know that no other things that you can do are going to justify yourself even if you walk out and you shama lama ding dong like the rest of Christianity you want to do that? You can do it oh man you can play that game you ain't getting nowhere in that kingdom and God's will will still be done even with your intentions and doing that whole mess and go in your own direction, he will still have his power uh, 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 coming into the earth. His will will still be done, and his kingdom is still going to be established. You're not going to change a thing. Well, the only one you're going to affect is yourself. You want to justify yourself and get that religious spirit and do to tell everybody about how you believe a certain way and 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 you believe a certain doctrine, and you believe you should live a certain way, and that is your way to hold. You will not enter not even an inch into the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't work like that. It says you've fallen away from grace. You've alienated yourself from Christ. Why do you think when he, when 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 Jesus came to serve, and he came to wash his disciples' feet, and Peter's like, don't do that. He says, I tell you truly, unless you let me wash your feet, you literally have no part with me. You have no part in my kingdom. Love. That's servanthood. That's humility. If we have a king that has a humble heart, then we are supposed to model ourselves under him and make all of our decisions just like Christ, not by what we feel is good and not by what we feel is right, but by the will of the Father. That's why. It says when he fed the 5,000, the scripture literally says the people wanted to go and, and grab Jesus and make him a king by force. How many men and women have, have the desire of the will of the Father to turn away from raw power, from people taking you into the streets of Jerusalem to make you a king? And instead it says, he withdrew himself by himself to a mountaintop to go speak with the Lord by himself in solitude. So instead of going off of his carnal desires of wanting to be appointed to be a king by force, instead he was obedient and went to a solitary place to go get more instructions from the Lord. 
this is the model that you and I have to base our Christianity on. That every decision that you make, that before you make the decision, ask the Lord whether or not you should be doing X, Y, and Z. Ask the Lord before you do anything. Let him give you the answer on what you should do. So, therefore, in all things, go back to love. Love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, and soul. And as you walk out your faith by him leading you, then you will truly become alive. You will fulfill that scripture that says in in Matthew 6.33, which says, but first, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So God says, if you do this, and even if I ask you to do completely unconventional things, that don't make any lick of sense, all these things will be added unto you. So even if you can't see the outcome, the outcome is waiting for you to be released into your hands. So it is very, very important to follow the instructions of the Lord. If a prophet of the Lord gives you instructions, he tells you to do something, Do it. Do it without delay. There's testimony for those that have. God has never failed. He has never failed. Anyone that follows his direction and listens to his words that come by faith, when you hear by faith, you won't just hear just that one voice. Remember, you'll hear by multiple sources. God can speak to you in many forms, not just by speaking to you audibly. He'll speak to you in that in, in your spirit. So it's kind of like that voice that you can hear on the inside of your heart. He could speak to you in that. For those that don't know the you know the voice in your heart, go read a book and you, you read it. You hear that voice in your head. Well, you'll hear in that same way, but it will be through the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can hear uh, uh, instructions. By uh, dreams, I mean even the Pharaoh, a, a, a godless man, had a dream. Never Nebuchadnezzar had a dream from the Lord. Okay, um, visions. Uh, uh, you can hear by reading the Word and receiving revelation. You can hear by the Holy Spirit prophetically speaking to another believer, and they speak to you. That's why the Lord gave us prophets. Why God gave us prophets of God and gave us the gift of prophecy, and why it says the Scripture says, "Do not forsake the assembly of your brethren." So, just in case those there are people that say, "Well, I just want to hear from God. I I heard the instructions from you, prophet, but I want to hear it for myself." Well, when you when you heard from the prophet, you did hear for yourself because that's one of the ways that God communicates. And many times, the Holy Spirit speaks to me and sounds just like my wife's voice. My wife is highly prophetic. She goes and prays, and she'll come and speak to me, but that's not the only way. There are other times I hear from other prophets that are in my life. So when you hear, be prepared that it will come to more than just one me. And when you do hear, and when you set your heart to love, God will also increase, just like when it says in James, when you ask for that increase of the gift of faith, and you ask for the increase of of love in your life, well, increase your capacity to level, that also increases the capacity for the discerning of spirits so that when you hear, even through these other sources, when you hear through these other uh, resources like a prophet, and you'll know a prophet by their fruit, it says in the word, um, that the discernment in you will know the difference and will go, okay, that is an authenticated word from the Lord. And then when you hear it, follow those instructions. But don't just limit this to just you know, what you might think is big decisions in your life, begin to live your life daily in your spirit, moment by moment, by listening. That's that's the important. And then by doing so, it says you will seek his kingdom. That will literally be the epitome of you seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, it says, will be given to you as well. So where do we start? 
where do we start? This is where where we start in 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 how we begin this process of walking this out. We have to model ourselves with the heart of love and humility and repentance, like the man on the cross that was right beside Jesus Christ as he was dying. That you model yourself after the man that was on the cross who was hanging with Jesus, and uh, the exchange. Uh, that that when he spoke is found in the book of Luke, chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. Again, that's Luke chapter 23. Uh, yeah, Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. And here's the two criminals that are right beside uh, Jesus. So, yes, we're going to put how, where, where do you start this journey? By following the example of a criminal that's uh, carrying out his death sentence. That might be – that's that's not what the church would normally, you know, would normally say. See, by faith, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, if you had a pastor today said, you know, where, 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 should, our, where should the modeling of our faith begin, and, and we'll use it as an example. You, let's, let's use it uh, from this criminal that's on death row that's, like, literally having a sentence carried out. Let's, let's follow his example, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense in the world, but this is how faith works. So this is the exchange. It says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insult at, at Christ. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us! But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. What a profound, absolutely profound, miraculous thing that was just done. That you have the heart like this criminal, where he recognized and he turned his heart to humility, which is the fear of the Lord, the heart of repentance and love, and ask the Lord to remember him when he comes into his kingdom, also displaying great faith, not only recognizing Christ's authority, his ability to forgive sins, but his dominion over all things, and that the fact that he is coming into his kingdom such multitudes of different facets of faith that come through love exercised in one moment, even as the man was carrying out his own death sentence, and Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Saints of God, set your heart to love. Set your heart to humility and meekness, gentleness, forbearance, patience, kindness. Love, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. All of the fruits of the Spirit. So that you can have the heart of humility and repentance like this man had. That gains you entry. Not the use of the gifts. Not what you think you know by the law and how you justify yourself by your religious holy acts. And not by your good intentions but by your humility and love and obedience, obedience to his will. Set your heart like the man who was this criminal, who is unnamed. It just said, the criminal. But the other criminal rebuked him, never even gave his name. That you set your heart into that place of love. Humble yourself and begin asking God in using the faith that God gave you to be obedient no matter how difficult it is. You are walking into a season of unparalleled calamity. Unparalleled tribulation. Unparalleled deception. Unparalleled. Those that do will gain the crown of life. You will enter through the narrow gate 
and it will be narrow. That is how to know how to do and how to walk out the will of the Father. This is how to do the will of the Father and not your own. Oh, that's good. Somebody on this planet Earth has got to say amen about something. Yes, amen. I'll just hear some music in the background. Amen. 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 Right. Right. Hey, um. still led to open the phone lines up. I don't feel led. I felt I, I uh, am led by the Holy Spirit that this was the message that you guys needed to receive. You needed to receive this today. It's more important that you focus on this and we don't get distracted by anybody asking arbitrary questions or you know, uh, the normal prayer requests or normal testimony time. There'll be plenty of time for that later. It's more important that each of you receive this. It is life in its death. For those that need a word of encouragement, uh, you can reach me after this phone call. Um, you, you can reach me after this phone call. But as for this, I'm going to I'm gonna go ahead and, and um, I'm going to wrap up this 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 recording now. This this is important that you receive this. So what I'll do is um, for those of you that uh, you have a prayer request or you have a testimony you'd like to share, what I'm going to do is is um, if you if you've got a prayer request, I'm going to make myself available. Uh, I'm going to hang up the phone, and what I'm going to do is in five minutes I'll go ahead and I'll call back. This, this conference line, the 541-525-9473. Uh, and anybody that has any prayer requests or any encouragement or anything they need, I'll, the, the Holy Spirit will be there for you in that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hang up the phone. We're going to take a five-minute breather. And anybody that wants to come back, you just call that phone number back, and in five minutes I'll be on the phone and uh, receive anybody that has any um, prayer requests or has any testimony they'd like to share. Other than that, I'm going to go ahead and And uh, this is the word that you guys needed to hear today. And I thank the Lord. And, Lord, I give your name all the glory. Let your son, Jesus Christ, receive all the glory from this. And I pray that people receive this and that we come together and we bind in the name of Jesus. We bind every spirit that would try to steal this word from anybody's heart. That, Lord, you will firmly implant this into the heart of every man and woman that heard this today, Lord, and that they will be uh, uh, obedient, and they will persevere with every word of faith that, Lord, you gave today on this phone call. And every one of us said, in the name of Jesus, amen. 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 God bless you guys. I'll see you in five minutes for those that need a prayer request. See you guys. Amen.